some of the time, and substituting A request for mutual legal assistance was received from Botswana. One June 2022, Derko delivered the evidence to the High Commissioner of Botswana. For the purpose of central authority, the matter has been finalized. And you will note that in all the extradition matters are matters between the two, the requester and the requesting state. This one is um, a bit unique because of uh, in, uh, intervention of a party which is not a state player. Mr. Bobrov and uh, Israel. In March 2017, an Israel police investigation was initiated after freezing assets based on suspicions on suspicious transactions by the suspect, Mr. Darren Bobrov. The Israel money laundering investigation suspected that the funds were proceeds of offenses that Mr. Bobrov and his father, Ronald, had allegedly committed in South Africa. Therefore, on May 8, 2017, Israel sent South Africa a request for legal assistance to provide information concerning the South African investigation. Israel also requested that South Africa send a request for legal assistance to seize the assets on South Africa's behalf for their investigations. Unfortunately, it was determined determined investigative avenue was not viable. Since it was not possible to establish a link between said assets and the offenses allegedly committed by Bobrov in South Africa. Consequently, Israel was unable to execute South Africa's request for legal assistance due to the inability to link the assets to the South African investigation. The seized assets were at, were at immediate risk of being released. As such, in January 2019, Israel sent a delegation to South Africa after a productive meeting with the South African counterparts. Israel was able to build a domestic money laundering investigation against Mr. Bobrov regarding offenses that Bobrov perpetrated towards the Israel banks. In the context of this domestic investigation, South Africa provided in important legal assistance, in particular the provision of vital affidavit by SARS representatives. A civil forfeiture proceeding was also initiated by the Israel prosecution based on the same Israel domestic offenses. In the context of the Africa indicated to the NPA that they intend to petition the Constitutional Court to stop the process. Pleadings are currently being exchanged and the court date is yet to be determined. The Nor de Ver matter, Namibia, uh, known here in South Africa as the matter related to Palapala. The request which the Department of Justice and Constitutional Development received from the Republic of, 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 of Namibia did not specifically in relation to Mr. David Imam Emanuela, only as intimidated by our sister nation's police force. It is not correct that there was no response from South Africa. 
on the request of mutual legal assistance in the case involving Mr. David Emanuela. The Central Authority of the Republic of South Africa has transmitted correspondence through diplomatic channels to set the record straight with the Namibian authorities. During September 2020, the Department of International Relations and Co Cooperation forwarded a note verbal from the High Commissioner from the Republic of Namibia and attached thereto a request for mutual legal assistance dated 13 August 2020 by the authorities in Namibia to the Department of Justice in South Africa. In the request, the authorities in Namibia requested assistance from South Africa in a criminal investigation relating to the contravention of Section 456 of the Prevention of Organized Crime Act 2004 of Namibia. The request was first referred to the Special Commercial Crimes Unit of the National Prosecuting Authority to ensure that the request does not involve um, foreign bribery, as South Africa acceded to the OECD Organized Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, Convention Against Bribery of Public Officials in International Business Transactions, the Bribery Convention during 2007. The request was thereafter returned to the Department by the SSSU with the recommendation that the request be processed. The matter was allocated to an official within the Chief Directorate, International Legal Relations, to process the request. The request was perused and found that it did not comply with the provisions of International Cooperation in Criminal Matters Act of 1996. The request could therefore not be processed at that stage. The request was returned to DERCO on 18 May 2021, accompanied by a letter indicating to the authorities in Namibia how the request should be amended to enable South Africa to render the necessary assistance. On 31 August 2021, DERCO sent an electronic note verbal to the High Commissioner of the Republic of Namibia highlighting the feedback from the department and requesting the authorities to amend the request. On 1 September 2021, the High Commissioner of the Republic of Namibia acknowledged receipt of the note verbal. Since then, the authorities in Namibia have not sent an amended request back to the Republic of South Africa. The Chief Directorate International Relations and, and Legal was previously requested to confirm whether a request for mutual legal assistance relating to Mr. David Emanuela had been received from the authorities in Namibia. As per the press statement, the request could not be located as the file was opened under a different name. The request related to an investigation of docket Nordeva Nord Ever CR 14 June of 2020, in which Mr. David was one of the three suspects. The other two suspects are Messias Petras Afrikaner and Eric Chicago. So because of this name, the request could not be located by the officials. On 16 June 2022, the Inspector General of the Namibian Police Force released a press statement which detailed, amongst others, a meeting between the police authorities of South Africa and Namibia where a certain operational information was allegedly shared on Mr. David and other Namibian nationals suspected of having stolen money from South Africa and fled to Namibia. And um, it is then that we received lots of questions. The Central Authority received lots of questions about this matter. And um, as I've said, it could not be located at the time because the name in which it was registered in the department is different from the one that appeared in the press release. At this point, the Central Authority is still awaiting the amended request from the authorities in Namibia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. Good afternoon, Minister Lamola, DG of Justice, uh, Advocate Mashabane, uh, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the matters that the Central Authority, the Minister, has decided to detail, but we're going to deal with just the one matter, and that is the submission of a formal application request 
for the extradition of Mr. Atul Kumar Gupta and Mr. Rajesh Kumar Gupta. Um, I can confirm as a August 2022. The application su was submitted both in English and Arabic and it addresses the general requirements for extradition which, if met, would allow the extradition to be granted under either the existing extradition treaty with the UAE or U the United Nations Convention Against Corruption, UNCAC, or both. Um, a multidisciplinary team within the NPA led by, le, sorry, led the legal aspect of the process and worked in a focused and well-coordinated manner with the Office of the DG of the Department of Justice and Constitutional Development, um, who, as you know, are designated as the central authority uh, for extradition processes. And so they worked together to prepare and finalize the, um, the application. This work included consultation with legal counsel and some team members meeting their counterparts in the UAE early this month to ensure that the request for extradition met all the requirements of the bilateral treaty, that it was in accordance with the UAE domestic laws and requirements, and to build trust with relevant law enforcement partners. The NPA team in close collaboration with the Office of the Central Authority, the, Depart uh, the Director General of Justice, worked relentlessly um, on complying with legal requirements of the extradition treaty and UNCAC. Political considerations regarding the extradition process were left fully in the hands of our partners in the Ministry of Justice, um, and also the Department of International Relations and Corporations, DERCO. The submission of the formal application request for the arrest and extradition of the Gupta brothers is an important milestone in the NPA's commitment to hold accountable perpetrators of state capture and to uphold the rule of law. It reaffirms our resolve to be the lawyers for the people and to seek collective justice for our country. As this process unfolds and the extradition application is heard in the UAE courts, the NPA will continue to collaborate and support its counterparts in the UAE to ensure that we do all that is necessary to have the Gupta brothers extradited and to face justice in South Africa. We must commend the UAE authorities for their cooperation during this process. Whereas this process could take several months, as the NPA, we will continue with our commitment to deliver justice for impact. The country demands this of us, and we are ready to keep moving to bring justice. Thank you. Thank you very much, NDPP and Minister. Colleagues, we'll now open for a round of questions. We'll start with our colleagues who are in the press room with us here. Um, we'll take five hands and we'll note all of your questions and then Minister will be assisted to respond to the questions by the Central Authority, the Director General, where possible. Okay, let's start at the back. Nkosi Kona Duma, um, Sister from SAPC, Erin and Karen, in that order. Um, good afternoon, Minister. Uh, perhaps could we get some clarity as to how many months are we looking at and also um, what could be happening in the interim before we hear an outcome of the extradition application? Got that. So just how long it will take? No, 
Yes. And? And the process is in the interim while we're waiting. What process happens? Okay. Thank you. Assistant. My name is Lansa Maseta from uh, BBC News. Um, Minister, I'd like to know, it is expected that the Guptas are, are going to fight this expedition and they are possibly going to claim hardship if they are jailed in South Africa. And given the reputation that South African prisons have internationally, how will you ensure that they are successfully brought into the country to face justice? And secondly, what is the current state of um, the Guptas um, where they're concerned? We understand that they have been remanded in local um, custody in the UAE after they were transferred from police cells. What I would like to know is, did they apply for bail in the interim um, in the UAE and was it denied as far as you know? Okay, so there are three questions there. Let's just, f just highlight them again for us. So it would be, given the reputation that South African prisons have internationally, case in point, trend one, what is it that the South African government is going to do to ensure that um, the Guptas are su success successfully brought into the country? Okay. Secondly, um, it, it's about w where, what the process is now with the Guptas. Are they in, uh, in, in prison cells? in the UAE, did they apply for bail, was it denied? Okay, yeah. so it's prison conditions um, and, and uh, have, a, have they applied for bail, what is their current status? Um, Erin and Karen. Thank you, you bumped me up because Karen was actually before me, but she's kindly agreed to let me go first. Um, I think I'm very much for the update, Erin Bates here from Business Day. Uh, my first question for the NDPP, when will the extradition matter be heard in the UAE? Do we have any indications? Secondly, who is on the National Prosecuting Authority's Council team for this? Obviously, it's a very high-profile matter of great interest to the public, and I think it would give us a lot of com confidence to know who you have uh, assigned to the matter. And then uh, Salim Essa, we know, has been sanctioned by both authorities in the UK and the US. There is a plethora of evidence against him in the Zonga Commission's findings and also its body of evidence for its work. Is there any effort to try and have him extradited to, and uh, are you working on a case against him? And then finally, you have promised the country, I think it's nine seminal cases on state capture by September. Uh, could you please just provide an update on how many of the nine are currently underway and how many are still pending? Thank you. Colleagues, just... Um Word of advice, really pick your questions. Don't throw a shopping list at the colleagues at the NDPP and the minister because I think some of the questions you ask are important. But if you throw a shopping list at them, then some of these things will be missed. So, okay, Karen. Okay. Um, uh, sorry, my question is for the NDPP. Um, the statement says that the Guptas, as I understand it, are being extradited to both New Lane and Estina. But as far as I know, the Estina matter that is in court against Tabete makes no mention of the Gupta brothers. Given that the um, extradition agreement with the UAE explicitly states that these have to be matters that are before the courts and people have to be charged, can you please provide us with the charge sheet and the further particulars um, in that matter? Um, and then just in relation to um, the process itself, are you confident that if you do get an extradition from the UAE authorities, because they seem extremely positive, there seems to be massive political will from them in regards to this, that the NPA will be able to mount a case that results in their conviction? Because as I'm sure you're aware in the New Lane matter, which is currently before the court, mm -hmm. their lawyers are saying that the case against them is non-existent, and they're actually bringing litigation to have it thrown out. So if that happens, what will the implications be for the NPA? And then lastly, in the Le New Lane matter, when the NPA sought red notices, they sought them for the Gupta's wives as well, on the basis that they were directors of Island Sight. And Island Sight, of course, is a pivotal accused in this matter. Have you abandoned efforts to seek the extradition of the wives? Because the case materially against the wives is very much the same case that is made against the husbands. And, you know, what are the implications should you not pursue the wives for New Lane. Thank you. Mr. Jones, I saw your hand come up last to, from ENC. Question. <coughs> Excuse me. Mr. Prudent Johnson, ENC. 
Could you just uh, an update on the Bashiri matter as well? I've been following this case very closely. And the last time I checked, when I spoke to some of the families of the witnesses, they actually refused mm. that they um, thought it was allegedly the case in this matter be taken to Malawi to testify. Um, and it seems as well it's becoming complex by matter again because his legal team at some point were also arguing that there weren't um, proper papers filed from um, the Correctional Services Department this side or correct the Justice Department. So maybe just an update on that uh, with respect as to how far it is. Thank you. No, will you specify what exactly is your question? Update. But we provided that update in the statement. No, but there seems to be confusion because the legal team are arguing that the department this side hasn't filed proper papers and there's also another matter with the witnesses having to go to Malawi as well. Okay. Maybe the name's confusing. Yeah, Shipiliru Kama. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, okay, we've heard all the questions. I think NDPP, if you are ready, you can come, followed by the central authority if there's anything that you'd like to clarify, and then the minister. Do these ones work here? Uh, or should I come there? You have to come here. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the first um, one with regard to, oh, I think I need that file, please, of some information. Let me leave that one for later. Um, the issue of, yeah, when will the matter be heard and some of the processes that would unfold, um, what we can say in that regard is that the matter will be placed before what is referred to as an appeal court in the UAE. Um, we advise that the, the judges actually work on, on a checklist and, and look to ensure that we've complied. The requesting state complies with all the requirements. Um, in approximately 30 days after this appeal court procedure, the matter is then taken to a Supreme Court, um, and thereafter the Attorney General will submit the matter to the Minister of Justice in the UAE for the final decision. So, you know, we cannot give exact uh, timelines. That's about as, as far as we can go. But we understand that it could take uh, a couple of months uh, to finalize. Um, in terms of the issue of bail, we understand that there were applications that were denied. Um, with regard to the issue of who is on the team, um, I'm not prepared to mention the names of the prosecutors and investigators on the team, obviously for security reasons, uh, but we did engage uh, in the early stages with external counsel as well, and that was widely reported on. Um, with regard to the issue of um, one of the suspects, I'm, I'm actually loath to mention the names of people, but of course they mentioned in the Zondo Commission reports there's a lot of public information about numerous suspects, but our um, approach is that we do not mention suspects until people appear in court. All I can say is that with regard to many people that have been mentioned, and, and some that haven't even been mentioned, um, the NPA is looking at, um, has organized itself um, after the, well, when the first Zondo Commission report was was. Uh, made public, uh, and subsequently we've organized ourselves, we've set up what we refer to as a task force internally and also with, with members of the DPCI and to the extent necessary SARS, and we are, we've, we've looked at many of the cases that have been mentioned uh, in the reports, um, we've prioritized them, and we are looking at um, a whole range of information and evidence that they may be available available against many suspects. Um, and once we go through this process, once we apply our own uh, independent investigation, once we are certain that we actually um, meet the standard of a reasonable prospects of a successful prosecution, we will then um, proceed to, to um, charge people and also, if it's necessary, uh, to make applications for others to be extradited, uh, we will deal with that as well. Um, 
with regard to the two matters that we've that have been mentioned, um, we are confident that we have evidence while well, Nulane is in court, but we certainly have evidence um, in the other matter that would actually um, meet the, the standard of uh, reasonable prospects of a successful prosecution, and those documents are being finalized as we speak. Um, the question of whether we will be um, confident that if we do get extradition, if, they, if the um, Gupta brothers are extradited, um, whether we will be able to mount a case that leads to a conviction. Wh what I want to assure the people of South Africa is that as the NPA, we do not bring cases unless we ourselves are satisfied that it meets the standard of a reasonable prospects of a successful prosecution. That is a standard that is required in terms of our policy, and we will only charge people if that standard is met. At the end of the day, whether there's a conviction or not depends on a whole range of reasons. And so, you know, we cannot guarantee, of course, that there will be a conviction. But what we can guarantee is that as the prosecuting authority, we will do everything possible to ensure that the prospects of a successful prosecution and a conviction is extremely high. And so, um, you know, hopefully that um, you know, that's as far as we can take it. Um, with regard to, to, to the one particular case where lawyers are saying that the case is non-existent, that's understandable. <clears throat> that is the role of some defense lawyers to try to create the impression that there's no case. But we expect that. And as long as we know in the NPA that we meet that standard, we cannot be sidetracked by comments that are made by defense lawyers, and we will also not be drawn into litigating matters in the, in, in the public space. And so often when these comments are made, you'll find that the NPA is not responding. It's not because we can't respond. It's because we will simply not be drawn into, as I say, litigation in the public space. Um, with regard to, to the wives of, of, of the two um, Gupta brothers, um, that matter is under consideration by the ID. I think there's one other question, but I'm going to hand over to the ID, uh, sorry, to the minister, and then come back with the one question, because I just want to find the information. Thank you, minister. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Chris, Minister and DPP. There, there's a question that uh, was the gentleman who asked the, the last question about uh, the Bushiri matter, that as far as you know, they are saying papers are not in order. That, that's not true. That's not the issue before the court. The issue before the court currently is about uh, South African witnesses, whether they should travel to Malawi to testify or make disposition from here. So. What the NDPP in Malawi did on, on our behalf is to make an application to have the matter moved from the magistrate court to high court so that they can make an application that witnesses in South Africa don't have to travel to Malawi to testify on the extradition proceedings. They can make statements here in a competent South African court or testify virtually if needs be. So, so the question of the filing of the papers is, is not an issue papers are in order. I needed to clarify that. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, with regards to the prison conditions, which is the question asked, is that um, the, we handle inmates in terms of the Correctional Services Act and as the South African government, we subscribe to the Nelson Mandela rules, which is the international standards for, 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 for keeping prisoners in any country. So we are international compliant in terms of the UN conventions. And um, our facilities are of a, a standard that um, is universally accepted. Um, and um, the standard of um, of any prison is guided by the by the Nelson Mandela rules, as I've said, which were adopted by the United Nations. 
So they are of a, a condition that is in terms of the, of the rules. The issues that you are raising, obviously from time to time they will arise, uh, issues of overcrowding and all the issues that uh, affect prisons. But those are consequence and come as a result of us handling inmates in terms of the, of the standards that were expected to handle them. Um, from time to time those challenges will arise, but we handle them, we deal with them, and our prisons are compliant with the international standards. So we are convinced that uh, there is um, there will be no case on the basis of the conditions of our prisons. Uh, across the globe, the standards were applying are the standards that are applied uh, across the globe. I think the other issue that was raised is the issue of the the political will uh, in terms of the executive to handle the matter. From our side, you have seen there is commitment and we are convinced that uh, there is also a political will to attend to the matter, uh, even in the UAE. Um, we have not seen anything since the signing of the of the extra of the treaty between the UAE and South Africa. We've seen cooperation, and including the ambassador of the UAE here in South Africa, we have received very good uh, cooperation, and um, even our ambassador of South Africa in the UAE. He has also told us that he is receiving very good cooperation from the authorities in the UAE. And um, I think that is the reason why um, he could also facilitate the meetings that the NBP spoke about between the prosecutors of the two um, um, sovereign states to be able to, be, uh, to meet, to deal with technical issues. Um, is because of that diplomatic mutual friendly relations between the, the two countries. Thank you. Okay, we will note your follow-up questions, but maybe let's also take some of the questions of the colleagues online, um, just so that we don't have an overlap of questions. Uh, Vanessa, I can't see you. Yeah, yeah. If you can just read out the questions for us that have not been answered yet, but the questions that have been answered, please um, do not refer to that. The colleagues do know exactly which questions have been answered already. Okay. Uh, this is a question from Kaukelo at USM. Um, he has two, actually. Other than the request from the Nadibi Namibian authorities, how much did the minister know about the Palapala saga, particularly the actions that followed, such as the hunting down of the alleged robbers. His second question is, how concerned is the NPA about perceptions of a cover-up in the handling of Pala Pala, uh, particularly because of the lack of feedback from law enforcement agencies <coughs> after cases were lost? Only the public protector has been transparent. Just read them again, just so that ministers are clear. Sorry. Other than the request from the Namibian authorities, how did the minister know, how much did the minister know about the Palapala saga, particularly the actions that followed, such as the hunting down of the alleged robbers? The second question is, how concerned is the NPA about perceptions of a cover-up in the handling of the Palapala issue, okay, particularly thank you. because of the lack of feedback from law enforcement agencies after cases were lodged? Only the public protector has been transparent. Okay. Then um, before you come, Minister, there's also a question in DPP um, where colleagues are saying specifically, are the Guptas in custody? Um, I know you've said that they've not been granted bail, but colleagues want to hear something else so we can update them on that. Well, we did. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then uh, maybe I can then take the moment to then take the follow-up questions in the room. Thank you. Um, Just yeah. one comment. Um, it's 53 days since the Guptas were arrested, so we're on the tail end of that 60-day window. Is this not an indication of being on the back foot? Because despite these very friendly and warm discussions between the two countries, uh, it seems to have taken quite a while to actually act on the arrest. 
and obviously uh, time is of the essence as the idiom goes. Why has it taken up to this point to get everything together when you knew, for example, that documents ideally need to be in Arabic, there have been discussions about the legal processes. Minister, you yourself spoke about the fact that there are different legislative frameworks in different countries. Uh, it, it could be a concern for those of us who are watching this. Um, and then just in terms of the Pala Pala matter, if Minister, you could just clarify in very clear terms uh, what the point is that you wanted to highlight today around the paperwork back and forth on extradition. I, I'm not sure it came through quite clear your view for me. Thank you. Yeah. Sure, just for two follow-ups and then we should be going again. I just want to ask something in regards to the Bushiri matter. Maybe just say an update on this one again. Are you positive with the, with the extradition process or thus far? Do you think as though you are on the winning side in terms of ensuring that there's accountability? And maybe just uh, with the uh, Minister Manuel Chang extradition process, perhaps maybe I missed this, but uh, how soon will this matter be wrapped up as well? Thanks. Hi, I just, I have a follow-up um, for Advocate um, in the terms, under the terms of the UAE South Africa extradition agreement, it says the parties agree to extradite each other pursuant to the provisions of this tre treaty, etc., etc. Um, persons who the authority in the requesting party have charged with or convicted of an extraditable offence. The treaty also demands that in circumstances uh, of a person accused of an offence, the requester shall be accompanied by an original certified true copy of the warrant of arrest and the charging document issued in the requesting party where the request is in the native tongue. So I, I'm just curious, in circumstances, because it does appear that while the NPA may have the intention to charge the Guptas in relation to Yasmina, you haven't actually done so. Is that not a concern? Because the provisions of this treaty make it explicitly clear that you can't charge on case, uh, you can't seek extraditions on matters that you haven't charged people with. Thanks. Okay, uh, NDPP, whilst you write that down, there's another question in our media WhatsApp group. Maybe this can be for the central authority directly. Um, is there an extradition request in relation to President Kama? Um, and then there's another question as well uh, on the security concerns, NDPP. Um, this is from Amanda Watson. Um, and she's saying, what are the security concerns around the team assigned to the Gupta extradition? Have they been threatened and by whom? Okay. Yeah, maybe DG. <coughs> Okay, thank you very much. Let me start with the the, the pala pala matter. I think uh, one part of it is what what did the minister know? Now, as as we have explained, that uh, the request was made by the central authorities in Namibia, but from our side, as the central authority, we found it not to be in order, and we took it back through the diplomatic processes for them to address issues that were lacking in the, in the request, which at the time as well, it was under different names. There was no David Emanuela as part of the request. So Minister ordinarily will not know about such a request until such time that the central authority is satisfied that the request is in order and meets all the requirements then we'll process an internal memorandum to the minister. Without that, then the minister will not know anything about uh, that process. And I think the same will apply to the National Director of Public Prosecution, where you are saying there's transparency from the public uh, protector, and NDPP has not said anything. The NDPP will also get to know once documents are finalized. So when they are at that stage, back and forth between the central authority. Uh, the, the National Director of Public Prosecution will not have a knowledge that uh, there are documents that are not in order that the Central Authority of South Africa has returned back to, to Namibia. So, so I think uh, uh, that that should be the understanding. And what was the point of this briefing? I thought it's a matter of interest because you remember that we make reference to the fact that uh, our counterparts in Namibia had issued a statement 
that they'd made a request to us and we never responded and that was the reason why they released uh, the suspects. And that's the information that the South African public has. So we needed to clarify this. And that's why Minister mentioned the fact that uh, as central authority, we have written a letter to our colleagues and counterparts in Namibia, putting it on record that it is not true that the matter is sitting with us. It is back in their court because we wrote back raising the matters. And we even reminded them and said, by the way, we wrote back to you seeking more information on this matter. Yes, the, the issue of the names, that's what I was talking about. That, By the way, that request didn't have any Emanuela that is mentioned as the key player in the so-called uh, Palapala saga. It was different names altogether. But still in those different names, the, there was a process in which indicated that the documents were not in order. And, and uh, the Emmanuel Cha, um, after the High Court uh, judgment, which reversed the minister's decision, and that Chang must be sent to the U.S., the Mozambican government appealed that decision. They, I think they filed applications both to the Constitutional Court and the Supreme Court of Appeal. And you know last month the Concord uh, uh, dismissed the matter. They did not admit it. So what is left now is for the Supreme Court of Appeal to, to set a date for a hearing for the appeal. So that's where it is until the, I mean, the Supreme Court of Appeal uh, takes a decision on that appeal, it means there's not much that can happen. Lastly, the an extradition request for President Kama, we have not yet received it. Uh, so, so we don't have it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Before I get to the specific of the nine seminal cases that we mentioned, just to, to mention some of the figures from our annual report from last year, um, they were with regard to anti-corruption cases. There were 380 cases that were finalized in the Specialized Commercial Crime Unit, the courts, with a verdict, uh, with a 90.5% conviction rate, which was 73 more than the previous year. Uh, with regard to the ID, uh, there are 26 cases on the roll, uh, 20 criminal and 6 civil. Well, this was at the time of, of, the, of the annual report. And the ID had restraining orders valued at over $6 billion. Um, there were 380 government officials convicted for corruption and related offences, um, 209 persons convicted of private sector corruption, um, with regard to money laundering cases, 86 were finalized with a verdict. Um, with regard to um, asset uh, forfeiture, um, there are 370 completed confiscation and forfeiture orders, estimated value at 406 million, and the number of freezing orders uh, estimated at 5.5 billion. Um, we, we accept that there's a lot more work to do, and we're certainly working very, very hard on this. Um, we, are, we are ensuring that all the cases have the necessary resources. Um, we've had good uh, support uh, from the Department of Justice. We're working very, very well. Um, the ID is working extremely well now with relevant stakeholders. Um, and sh so this enhanced collaboration and ensuring that there's sufficient but also dedicated resources with regard to the matters particularly um, emanating from state capture reports and also those not mentioned there. So that is critical in the sense of dedicated resources in the ID space, in the DPCI space, as well as in the specialized commercial crime unit space, as well as asset forfeiture um, in the NPA. And so dealing specifically with, with, the, with the, we've mentioned nine seminal cases. Um, some of them have already been enrolled. Um, let me just get those. Um, I think there are three that have been, some have been enrolled. Um, State versus Kuban Mudli matter, um, the Transnet um, former executive. Um, well, that's going to be in court on the 29th of August. 
State versus Ronika Raghavan and others in the Tegata and Optimum coal mine matter, the reha rehab matter, in the Johannesburg High Court on the 1st of November 2022, and State versus Mohideen and others, uh, which is an ABB matter, which is back in Randburg Magistrates Court on the 14th of October. Um, so some matters have already been enrolled. I have every confidence that we are well on track to enroll not just the nine seminal cases we've mentioned, but also many others that will be impactful cases, uh, both in the ID space as well as in the DPCI SCCU space, uh, as well as asset recovery. Um, with regard to the, um, the um, I should mention, I, I was, sorry, this question on, on being on the back foot, having submitted the papers uh, one week before the deadline, this is hardly being on the back foot. It's really, um, you know, it's, we could have submitted on the last day. That would be on the back foot. The fact that we've submitted early um, gives us time uh, to deal with it if there are any issues. Um, and as I said, with the good relationship, working relationship we've had with the UAE, we think that um, we have sufficient time in the unlikely event because as the minister had said, there's already been collaboration and we're quite confident that our papers are in order. Um, in fact, there was, if you look at the whole process, um, we, we were, you know, one might think 60 days is a long time, but it's really not a long time. It's really a very, very short space of time. And so we needed to ensure many things, including that we had an A team within the NPA and also engaging with senior counsel externally to ensure that we had our papers drafted in the best possible way. And so we, we, we got internal expertise um, of colleagues that were working in mutual, in the extradition and the MLA um, space, uh, including colleagues that had actually just retired, but we brought them back. Um, so we work, we had a really, really, a team with the team within the NPA was one that had all the necessary expertise to deal with the issues, um, the important issues uh, with regard to this type of request. And we also engaged with external counsel, as we mentioned. Um, and then in addition to that, once you had the papers, there were various different processes internally to ensure quality control. Um, we then had to make sure that that um, all the documents were were translated uh, into Arabic, but they were all these. Th they were not sequential. Many of these processes were actually running in parallel to make sure that we actually met the deadline and we met it well within um, the 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 deadline that was um, of sixty days. So we we very confident about about the the request about the quality of the request, um, and now we'll wait for the processes in the UAE to unfold. Um, we also, in this process, as the minister said, actually engaged with colleagues in the UAE um, to ensure that we had met all the requirements. Um, yes, we are we are well aware of the of the you know the the specificity and, and speciality clauses in terms of extradition. Um, we are confident that, notwithstanding uh, the fact that uh, Nulani and Estina are the only two matters that are mentioned. Um, we don't want to actually say anything more about this because this is an issue that will certainly be the subject of possible litigation. But as the NPA, we are quite confident that we'll be able to deal with those issues. Um, in terms of the security concerns, um, the staff have not been threatened, which is really good, but we're not taking any chances. Um, we, we know that, um, you know, the... The, the risks are high uh, in the sense that there are many people that will want to ensure that they do not face justice in South Africa. And so we don't want to take any chances and put our people unnecessarily at risk. Um, but for now, nobody has been threatened. But as I said, we're not taking any chances. Um, and uh, I think, Crispin, you clarified the issue about the bail. and. Okay, so just to let, I think there was, uh, Crispin advises me that it wasn't clear about whether the uh, Gupta brothers are in custody. They are. Thank you.
Yeah, no, thank you. The I think the DG has responded to what I will have known on this uh, pala pala matter. I know there is an excitement to presume that the there was some kind of a cover up either by myself or anyone on this matter. But uh, the DG has explained that how the process works is that it will be the official who received the request, who knows, in the central authority. And um, when they have processed, they have dealt with all the administrative issues, it's when a memorandum will then be routed to myself to look at it and approve and whatever that may need to be done. And this matter had not yet reached that stage for a memorandum to be brought to me to sign or to do whatever. And it is the same that he, re he, re he related to with regard to the NDP. They will not have also not have received that uh, request because there were still issues that the central authority and the and the central authority of Namibia still had to deal with before they could bring the matter to to us. So I did not know that there was such a request uh, with regards to this Palafala matter. And um, as the DG said, that um, also the, the how it was phrased in terms of the name, how it uh, the file was opened. It was opened as Nord Verk or something. So when the statement was issued, we asked from the department, central authorities and officials, that have you received this request? And they searched everywhere. They said, no, we have not received this type of request. And we, there were exchanges between the central authority, the DG, DERCO, and Namibian authorities to really understand, indeed, did we really receive this kind of request? It's only when um, we then got um, the approval uh, stamp of receipt from DERCO that showed that indeed there was a request that came in. But the request was under this phrasing of uh, Norveg and there were three accused people. And one of the accused people was this uh, uh, Naulan or something, uh, David Emanuela. David Emanuela. Yeah. It's only when then they went back again and checked that they realized that indeed this came through. Then the issue was what then happened when it came through? It was realized that the department responded to the Namibian authorities to say the request has come through on this matter, but it is not in compliance with the uh, with the act, and this is how you must make the request compliant with the act, which there was no response. And again, when that was realized, the DG as the central authority dispatched another not verbal to the Namibian authorities to say this was our response that this does not meet the requirements of the act. We are, are still awaiting for you to provide us with the one that is, uh, is compliant. And that is where the matter is, as we speak now. We stand ready to cooperate, to work with our Namibian authorities, because we have had, always had very good mutual um, cooperation between these two, the two state uh, sovereign parties. And the uh, request comes from both countries with no difficulty. Even ourselves, when we need help from them, they help us uh, in terms of the, of the agreements, which we, we think that cooperation, that mutual cooperation will continue. With regards to the matter of uh, Mr. Shipililo uh, Gama, I think maybe uh, we did uh, refer to it in the in the statement, uh, Mr. Shipiro Gama is the is the man uh, well known as uh, Prophet Shepherd Bushir, but um, his official uh, his names that we have is Mr. Shipiro Gama, well known as Shepherd Bushir. We did update on that, and I think the DG has explained where the matter is. Our papers are compliant. I don't know where does it come from that there is someone who is raising that our matter papers are not compliant. It's in order. The matters are being ventilated in the courts of Malawi. That is where the matter is now. Yeah, the courts of Malawi are dealing with the matter. 
and uh, we are awaiting the outcomes. Uh, I think it's the fifth of August, or yeah, that is what we. That's where we are on the on the on that matter. Whether there is um, a mutual cooperation between the two sovereign states, uh, South Africa and Malawi, yes, there is, and we also process their request from time to time. What we have given you here is just a fraction of what we deal with. We deal with a lot of requests and lots of jurisdictions across the globe. Um, and the Malawian authorities up to so far, we have been cooperating with them very well. And um, I do think that um, even the courts of Malawi up to so far have handled the matter uh, very well. Um, they've proven their independence. The, the matter is being ventilated because Malawi is also using our kind of a common law system. And um, up to so far, we think that the matter is receiving the necessary attention. But um, that does not take away from the reality that extradition matters and this cut across, even the one which is in the UAE, can by their very nature be um, protracted because there could be protracted legal processes in any extradition matter. If you look at the one of the Netherlands that I gave you an update on, it's a very old matter. Since 2002, we are still in court, even now, exchanging documents and all that. So extradition by its nature can be a legal, can be a protracted legal process. But um, from our side as the central authority, we stand ready to take um, any legal uh, challenge in any part of the world. And that is what is currently happening in Malawi. And we stand ready with regards to the UAE to take any legal challenge that may arise. We believe that um, um, there are grounds in terms of the treaty and in terms of the Extradition Act for us to stand and for our request to withstand any scrutiny in any jurisdiction in the world in line with the United Nations uh, Convention. Thank you. Thank you. There was a question about any concerns about perceptions of a cover-up with regard to the Pala Pala matter. Um, just to say on this, the NPA is not involved in the investigations. The DPCI are conducting investigations. Um, and once they, they reach a point when they feel that the NPA needs to be engaged, they will, and then we will deal with the matter as, as appropriate at the time. Uh, but just to say that this matter will be dealt with like any other matter. Um, the rule of law must prevail in our country, no matter what. And so, um, you know, just dealing with um, with the issue of, of the Estina, just to complete my response there, warrants of arrest have been issued, but they haven't been executed. So that matter will need to be re-enrolled. Um, with regard to, um, um, you know, media engagements uh, by the NPA, I want to say, you know, they they there's, there's a, there seems to be a, a suggestion that the NPA does not speak to the media often enough. Perhaps the national director does not speak too often, but in many, many jurisdictions around the world, the prosecuting authority don't speak at all, or they speak in a very limited way. In a sense, I think as the NPA, we have been very transparent. We have been very engaging with the media. We have been open. If the national director doesn't speak, there are many, there's many other members of the NPA that talk to the media. If and when there's a need for the national director to speak, like today, uh, we will certainly address, address the media. But we have so many different initiatives to engage more with the people of South Africa. For example, the DPPs in each of the regions um, have these media briefings in the particular region dealing with what uh, activities, uh, you know, challenges, uh, progress in various cases, in, including state, state capture and other corruption cases in particular regions. Uh, we've had civil society engagements. So, you know, we are trying to be as transparent and accountable as possible, and we will continue to do that. It's really important that as the NPA, we are held accountable. But I really want to want to assure the people of South Africa is that we take our work very seriously. It's been a tough road. But we know what we have to do. 
and whether it's tomorrow, whether it's uh, three months, four months, six months, a year, um, if there's evidence and there's a case, we will take decisions to prosecute. The rule of law will be the only thing that guides us in that decision-making process. It doesn't matter who it is. It doesn't matter when it is. We will do what the Constitution requires us to do. Thank you very much. There is one issue that um, I forgot to, to, to address earlier on. Is this issue that uh, as the central authority, we are on a back foot also with the, the NPA on submission of the extradition request? Is that uh, if a reasonable period of submitting an extradition request in the view of the two central authorities and the two countries was an hour after an arrest or five days after an arrest, we will have put it in the treaty. It will have been in the treaty uh, governing South Africa and the UAE that uh, when you want to arrest anyone, there must already be an indictment, a warrant of arrest, the extradition request and papers must be ready that when this person is arrested, an hour after he's arrested, you must submit the extradition request. I think that is an unreasonable uh, proposition and conclusion because there was a reason why the 60 days period was put in the extradition treaty. To give both parties an opportunity. Uh, you might be having the charges, the indictment ready and everything, but the legal processes of the two countries are different. And when you have got uh, an extradition request in this light, particularly the one that we're dealing with of the UAE, unlike the one in Malawi, by the time the NPA drafted the whatever and the central authority had to request, we knew that uh, Mr. Gama is in Malawi. But this was done in terms of a red notice. These guys could have been arrested anyway. They could have been arrested in India. They could have been arrested in Kazakhstan. They could have been arrested in the United States of America. They could have been arrested in Zimbabwe or in Mozambique or in Ivory Coast or in France. So we did not know where they are. The red notice was given to all countries in the world which are members of Interpol. While there was some strong belief that they might be in the UAE, but there was no official confirmation that they are in the UAE. And also from time to time, there will be rumors that they're in India, there will be rumor that they are in this other country. So we could not work on a rumor and uh, put an interpretation in Arabic on the basis of a rumor. Hence, after the arrest, it is then that you can then translate into whatever language. If they are in France, you can then engage with the French authorities that you have arrested our person. What are the requirements there in France? Yeah, we've got a treaty, we know. But in terms of French interpretation, all those kind of technicalities, it's necessary that the authorities must engage on them. And this is what happened on this matter. The central authority had to engage uh, on the other issues that relates to the treaty and all that. The NPA and their counterparts, the authorities in the UAE, they also had to engage on their issues that relate to what they are dealing with, including the language, Arabic, and all, all those things. You can't do them in one hour or five, in five days. So I think that the proposition is, um, is unreasonable. So the 60 days, there is no big foot. And from our side, as the central authority, we want to thank the officials who worked on the matter, the officials from justice, and also the officials from the NPA. And uh, I also want to deal with this notion that we do not have the expertise to handle these extradition things. If you listened to me for that 30 minutes, all those matters are handled by officials from both the NPA and the Department of Justice internal. We only engage external counsel just to confirm whether we are on the, you know, to also have a second opinion because you are also dealing with matters of uh, 
national interest. But the officials in the department have been excellent who are dealing with these matters and even from the NPA. They also negotiated the treaty. They negotiated the extradition treaty. They negotiated um, that process up until we signed. So these are experts in the field. They've been there for many, many years. And they deal with many issues, as I said here. Yeah. What I gave you uh, is just a fraction of what we deal with because we believe these are matters of national interest. But there is a lot of matters that on a day-to-day -day basis we deal with on this aspect. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Minister, for those closing remarks. Uh, I saw someone on Twitter said, why don't they just use Google Translate? Um, <laughs> so I think you've really explained um, the importance of this and how it works. It's a legal process. Indeed. Um, so with that said, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to draw this press conference to a close. And those of us who may want to seek interviews know what the process is. Thank you very much.